Hello and welcome to Vox Markets. I am John Hewan and I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Tom Oakley, founder and chief exec of Medical Technology Specialist Feedback. How are you doing, Tom? Hi, John. Nice to be with you. Yeah, excellent. Thanks for coming on. Um, had some results out today. Um, lots of interesting stuff to talk about in there. Um, in, in terms of the headline figures, the challenges of dealing with the NHS uh, to date are, are apparent, but there's huge progress behind the scenes that doesn't yet show up in the numbers. But before we come on to that, perhaps talk us through, through the headline figures. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, as you said, I think our, our revenue has gone down slightly on the previous period. Um, that's partly because of the recognition that we had of the QBH pilot contract extension uh, this time last year. Um, so actually not artificially um, not artificially low. It also aligns with what we are expecting to see in the typical NHS um, procurement cycle. I think we've gone through this phase many times in our uh, recent history. Actually, the NHS makes most of its procurement decisions at the end of March and at the beginning of April. We we have seen a slight expansion of the uh, EBITDA loss, um, 1.67 million this year versus uh, 1.23 million of the, the same period. And that's both driven by that slight reduction in, in recognised revenue for the period, but also the fact that we have invested more in staff um, and that we are investing for the growth of the business, pending all the exciting opportunities that I'm sure we'll be discussing in a minute. Yeah, we, um, we can discuss them now. Um, you know, lo lots of uh, lots of opportunities coming your way um, and lots of progress post, post the period end, it seems. Um, and I think the most, I, I guess, but from my perspective, the most interesting looking thing is the uh, the report from the all party parliamentary group on, on CDCs, which really feels like it's it's going to unlock a lot of opportunities for you. Perhaps, perhaps we can start by talking about that. It really, really sort of points to the uh, the value of your solutions. As a, perhaps, perhaps to start with, remind us what what Bleeper and Carelocker do uh, and why that's been recognised by the uh, the all party parliamentary group. Yeah, no, absolutely. So our technology is fundamentally about centralizing a patient's data into a common place and then being able to bring multiple clinical stakeholders together around that view of data so that they can make decisions and what that means is that patients can attend anywhere for investigation and be treated by specialists in any location and we can move patients between primary care so gps through these diagnostic centers all the way through to secondary care where they are um, then discussed by by relevant specialists and a management plan created and what we have been doing through the deployment of a symptom-based pathway at Queen Victoria Hospital for about two years now is essentially seeing how by operating that model, by allowing patients to go straight for diagnostic tests rather than having to see a specialist beforehand, and then having those tests reviewed by multiple specialists rather than just a single specialist, whether we can drive down the patient, um, patient wait times. And we've been very successful at doing that. So we've actually delivered a 69% reduction in patient wait times. Um, we have seen a 88% reduction in the requirement for an outpatient appointment, which means that the patient doesn't have to physically go to hospital to see the clinician. And it means that the hospital on average is saving about £295 per patient that's going through that pathway. So substantial savings for the NHS at scale. But perhaps one of the most impactful things is that we've delivered both a, a reduction in wait list and a reduction in outpatient requirement without actually needing any more clinical staff. And it won't have escaped anyone's notice that the big pressures facing the NHS at the minute are a growing wait list of almost 8 million patients now, um, a, a big cash shortfall, and the fact that they can't really recruit in enough staff. So we are hitting all three of the key pain points for the NHS. And as you mentioned, the, the all-party parliamentary group for diagnostics, we essentially presented these findings to the APPBG. Um, that was back in June, and that led to a series of conversations with the national team, so the national CDC team at NHS England. Um, and over the course of a number of months, we actually uh, managed to persuade them to provide additional funding for us to expand the pilots to a couple of different sites to see if we could translate the work we've done at Queen Victoria Hospital to those locations. So they awarded us £300,000 worth of funding to do a pilot of a breathlessness pathway at Amersham, which is a, a, a single CDC site, and then a, a much larger um, financial package to then actually look at how we could do this at a regional level across Berkshire, Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire. And um, those pilots run until the end of March. And then we are hoping that they will either expand to further pilots or convert into contracts and 
um, we will update the market as soon as we know which way that that's looking to go. Um, but it's a great use case for us to test the technology in, in other settings and to to prove that the the um, benefits translate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the NHS has has been somewhat slow to adopt digital technologies, but it does feel like the, the, such digital technologies are absolutely key to, to improving the productivity of the NHS. You, you know, just it, it feels like we're at a tipping point. Would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. I don't think there is another way out for them. And in fact, at the APPG session, what we were saying is that um, you've made a big capital investment in buildings and in staff. But actually, what you're generating are just standalone diagnostic tests. That doesn't actually result in the patient pathway accelerating. So if you want to use CDCs to reduce wait lists, it's all about getting the diagnostic results under the nose of clinical stakeholders, prompting them to look at them and make a decision off it. So we are all about converting from diagnostic test to clinical decision and getting their decision for the patient, because that's that's really what gets the wait list down. Yeah. And therefore, the third pillar the NHS needs to invest in now is digital. Yeah. And that's, that's I think that message is resonating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It definitely, definitely feels like, and I guess, you know, you know, as well as sort of waiting lists, you know, numbers, you know, these things we hear about, but I guess the ultimate aim is to, to, to you know, patient outcomes, improve patient outcomes, save lives. Yeah, absolutely. Fundamentally, we know that thousands of patients are dying on waiting lists at the minute unnecessarily and that also because of a delay in getting diagnostic tests you're actually picking up diseases much later in their in their sort of path and actually we know with cancer particularly the earlier you get to it the better your chance of survival so it's it's a double hit not only are you waiting to be diagnosed but you're then also waiting to be treated and actually if you can the power of what we offer is that we allow the clinicians to review those results remotely and to discuss them asynchronously and what we mean by asynchronous is that rather than having a video call, which means you can do it across different um, geographies, you don't actually have to be together at the same time with Bleeper. This is chat-based interaction. So you can contribute to this discussion in and around your other clinical work. You don't have to block out a Friday morning slot. And that means two things. One, that Friday morning slot that you would have used as a clinician for this MDT discussion, you can now use for additional surgical procedures or angio lists so you get a double hit of efficiency um, but it also means that the patient doesn't have to wait to be discussed on a Friday morning the discussion starts straight away and so we can reach that decision that much faster for the patient and, and that's critical yeah yeah absolutely um I mean the NHS is uh you know obviously this is key to, to as we, we talked about improving the productivity there but but actually you're expanding outside of, of the NHS as well I think you announced today uh, uh your first deal in private healthcare with the medical imaging partnership can you talk us through that and, and its significance and, and actually sort of how how it perhaps also reflects a sort of tighter integration of private provision and, and the NHS provision yeah absolutely so th this is all about can we bring that pathway efficiency model that we've developed in the NHS to private providers to help them to deliver better quality care to their patients at a lower price point? And that's that's fundamentally what we're, we're looking to prove. Um, Medical Imaging Partnership, it, it, they're a very innovative provider. They're based in the southeast of England. Um, they are developing a series of straight to diagnostic pathways initially with um, prostate screening where you use MRI rather than a biopsy. Um, which is obviously much better for patients um, and then also building out a series of gynae and cardiac pathways that we would look to support so at the minute we're entering a phase of evaluation where we're seeing how best to put those pathways onto the platform um, and deciding when best to launch that but then when we go through to the formal pilot that will be on a paid basis um, and they will cover the license costs for, for, for the platform and uh, MIP, although they're very innovative, they're relatively small, but what it does do is prove the point that this pathway model can be adopted by the private sector. And therefore, we're also in conversations with larger providers in the private space and also some of the insurance providers that are looking to deliver those same benefits. I think it's worth saying that at the minute, with all the wait lists in the NHS, a lot of people are activating their health insurance policies, which, of course, somewhat breaks the insurance model and therefore insurers are having to find more efficient ways of delivering the same care which really creates an opportunity for us given what we've demonstrated we can do in the nhs and i think the the, the other arm of this is the nhs out of necessity is also outsourcing a lot of this outpatient work to the private space so being able to prove that they could do that through a more efficient more cost effective method by adopting a straight to diagnostic asynchronous pathway um, means that actually we may be able to outsource more NHS work to private providers 
if they can do it at a more effective price point and probably at a, at a lower tariff whilst maintaining their margins. Um, so there's two things we're really proving. One, that we can improve the efficiency and, and cost of standard private pathways. And two, that we would potentially be able to um, therefore allow more NHS work to move into the private space, um, which I think benefits everyone. Yeah, indeed. Um, and uh, it opens up a big market opportunity as well. So, you know, across both the NHS and, and sort of provision of private healthcare in the UK, that, that adds up to a, a, a quite a chunky market. What, what, what sort of size are we looking at here? Well, um, our core opportunity around the CDC is in the order of about 96 million a year if we were to get all of the CDCs. Um, and there isn't really a technology that delivers what we do in this space. Um, so our positioning is quite unique in the market. So providing we can we can begin to pick up the pace a bit now that the NHS has realised the importance of what we are providing, um, I think our opportunity is really, really good in, in that regard. Um, and in terms of a private space, I think it depends quite what they're going to adopt it for and how broadly um, and whether they take it for core private work or whether they also use it for the NHS outsourcing. But again, it's very sizable. Yeah. Um, so we're saying that if we can prove the value here for the UK insurers, then that also smooths the way to potentially look at opportunities over the Atlantic um, where most delivery is insurance based and also extremely expensive. Mm. So uh, our eyes are beginning to look at wider opportunities as well. Yeah, um, I mean, you're already in uh, India. I noticed that you'd have appointed a, a dedicated managing director for the country. Talk, can you talk us through the uh, the Indian opportunity uh, and some of the developments there in, in terms of sort of you know product regulatory uh, progress that, that that you've made? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we first went to India um, about three years ago with a trade mission um, that was led by Lord Pryor, who was the chairman of NHS England, based on our initial success with with Bleeper in hospitals. Uh, on the basis that actually Indian hospitals have, by and large, the same requirements, they need their staff to collaborate more effectively to deliver more effective care to patients. Um, and the traditional methods of doing that are pages, email, and um, now WhatsApp. So they, they needed a better solution. Um, the difficulty we had is that because Bleeper is a medical device, we couldn't sell it immediately in India. And we had two choices. We either had to license it to a wholesaler in country, which would have meant handing over our technical information and putting our IP at risk, or we had to set up our own subsidiary and then essentially import into that subsidiary our, ourselves. So we've established these operating subsidiary and we received our import license for Bleeper as a medical device just at the end of last year, which means we can now start selling Bleeper in India, um, which is what we've been waiting for for all this time. And it coincided quite nicely with the appointment of Rohit as our in-country MD. Rohit joined us from the UK India Business Council and his, um, his expertise were all about bringing UK companies into India helping them to establish, helping them to scale. So he was exactly the right person for this. And he's already started to make substantial headway uh, in engaging client opportunities out there. I think that has also been supported by the fact that India are now adopting the equivalent of the GDPR legislation that also has with it substantial financial penalties for non-conformity. And that means that hospitals that are using WhatsApp in India are going to need to move away from them. And I think particularly larger hospitals who may have um, 50 or so hospitals as part of a group, they are particularly exposed to the risk of this, which creates a really good opportunity for us. Uh, yeah. I mean, India is so vast. We don't want to be chasing off the individual um, hospitals per se. We'd rather try and go for larger hospital groups. And I think they're the ones most affected by this, this legislative change. So um, near term opportunity there. Yep, and all the ingredients in place to, uh, to, to really go after that market. Uh, the other thing that struck me as very interesting was um, the, uh, the opportunity for licensing your technology and, and generate royalty income. Can you, can you talk us through exactly what's happening there? That, I mean, licensing is, is obviously a very profitable side of, of the business if you get that right. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, certainly for our legacy products, um, and in particular Cadran, um, we already have a licensing agreement with Imaging Engineering in the United States who really use this to upgrade a, a type of X-ray machine called fluoroscopy. And it allows them to convert that from an analog to a digital model. And um, means that rather than having to buy new equipment at quite high premiums, hospitals can just upgrade their old kit. And essentially we license the CADRAN component of that as part of that upgrade. And we just collect the royalties. There's, there's no ongoing support requirement for it. So it's, it is essentially just clear revenue for us, which is, which is fantastic. Um, we are spotting some further opportunities to do similar things in other spaces, again, using Cadran as a, as a legacy product. 
Um, and it also opens up the opportunity for us to consider whether we would license Bleeper uh, potentially through resellers in different markets. And certainly when we look at other international markets, that is something that we would we would consider. Um, but we'll more on that to come, I think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, well, it sounds like there's plenty more to come. Huge amounts of progress made uh, in, in, in the last six months. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us, Tom. No, thanks for the time. Thank you.